As we come down to the last presentation, we certainly are not expecting any kind of let up from the kind of preaching we have had all week long. Brother Daniel Denham is our speaker. He was born in Pensacola, Florida, is a graduate of the Bellevue Preacher Training School of Pensacola under Mass Klein, the Lake Reef Klein. He's done work on Taiwan. He also attended the Taipei Language Institute of Taipei. He served as instructor of Greek at uh, Bellevue Preacher Training School and the Spring Bible Institute. He taught classes at Florida School of Preaching. And he's been preaching now over 30 years and spoken on numerous brotherhood lectureships and conducted a number of gospel meetings in several states. He's the author of two tracts and many articles for various periodicals, including The Defender and Contending for the Faith. He's married to the former Barbara K. Stancliffe. and have been married for over 28 years, have three children, Sean, Trevor, and Megan. Megan's with him this week, right down there. And I was with him last year. And have, they have one grandchild. Uh, Daniel uh, also served as missionaries. I said I won and served as full-time evangelist at churches in Florida, Tennessee, Texas, and Virginia. And he currently serves at the Newport News Church of Christ in Newport News, Virginia, where I had the pleasure of being with them last year in a gospel meeting. And a very fine one it was. Enjoyed those good people. And they are very busy in home Bible studies and, and converting a number of people. You might one of what the kind of example we need to follow in places. We deeply appreciate him. I personally appreciate him as a, as a friend and wonderful friend as I do many of these brethren here. And uh, he's helped me so much when to the debates. Uh, he's a, it's a pleasure to have him sitting beside you because uh, just about anything anybody brings up, he'll say, oh, I know where he got that. It came out of this book, so and so and such and such, and almost from the page. And if you noticed all these books he had for sale back here, these used books, uh, I'm not telling you when, when I say he's read all of them. He tries to read three books a, re a week, and you've been doing that for many years. And, and uh, that's a pretty good goal, but it says he's quite good. In fact, um, more than good when it comes to the Greek language. And he's going to with us in our school as well as several of these other brethren. So please come and speak to us on the subject of should error regarding marriage, divorce and remarriage, disrupt fellowship between Christians. It is a distinct pleasure to be with you. We again, have an opportunity to have a part in this uh, lecture program. We love and appreciate the congregation here so very much, the elders, or the Brown, and uh, the support and encouragement of all the members here. We appreciate your stand for the tr truth, your love for souls. Brother Kent said, uh, concerning the food and the ladies that they were helps to be more widely. Uh, you might say we have an expanding ministry as a result of this. And we deeply appreciate the kindnesses that have been shown, the great food, and the great theme of this lectureship. It's not something that you love to preach on or have to deal with. I know personally I don't from the standpoint of the uh, anxieties that it causes, the sorrow that you have in having to deal with brethren that are in error. I would much rather, as Jude uh, indicated in Jude 3, or I think of Jude 3, speak on the common salvation. But we must contend earnestly for the faith. And brethren, concerning the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage, I'm tempted, as several speakers were the, this week, to simply say yes to the question. Should uh, division occur over this? Most certainly. 
when you have error, as defined earlier by Brother Bailey, error that leads to, that causes one or encourages one to sin, then by all means division ought to occur. Faithful people everywhere ought to stand up, speak against it and oppose it, and uh, resist it with every fiber of their be. The time when in the brotherhood fighting for the truth was not a dirty word or a dirty phrase. I sat at the feet of men like Brother Guy and Woods and G.K. Wallace, Gus Nichols, Foy Wallace, who were combative men when it came to standing for what was right. And they didn't back up from anyone. And brethren, we've got a, we've a generation today of namby pambies who uh, have signed a nation pact with the devil. And uh, that's where we are. And the same is true in marriage, divorce, remarriage. Now, there, if you look at the manuscript, you'll see there are about 50-something pages. Uh, I sent 59 pages. And that's not counting the references. And so there's no way I'm going to be able to cover every single error that's been taught on MDR. In fact, even the manuscript doesn't cover every error. It highlights 14 in particular. And what I'm going to do is shoot back and cover the last uh, three or four in particular because these are right now uh, on the front burner, so speak, in the Brotherhood. That is not to say that these other eras are less important and less in significance as the damning ability relative to the souls of men and women. Now, I ought to read that material because you know, the, what I'll be dealing with this evening, uh, some of the positions being taken are really into the hands of the eras that the other ten that I'll not be able to look at. And I hope to make that connection as we proceed. Surely, surely, no right-thinking person would desire to sanction a marriage that God forbids. But by the same token, no right-thinking uh, person should desire to forbid a marriage that God sanctions. And uh, yet, this is what we're facing in some places where both errors or both approaches are quite common. Relative to the first I want to look at this evening is the waiting game era. And not just in particular, but the misuse of that for us to apply to things that really do not fit the description of the waiting game. While no one, as far as I know, has actually formulated a full defense for this practice, it nonetheless has on occasion heard among our brethren. I know of at least one case where a couple uh, agreed to marry. They were fighting and fussing and uh, just carrying on. And finally, because of mutual incompatibility, they decided we're going to separate, we're going to, to, to uh, divorce, and uh, they did so. And later, they even confessed, each one of them, to various people, that they had in mind that what they were going to do was wait for the other one to commit adultery, to get married first, or to get a boyfriend or girlfriend, as the case might be, and then claim, hey, now I've got a scripture. All right. Well, brethren, that is a waiting game where they mutually agree to divorce and try to wait with her. That's the classic definition. But in that case, there is no innocent party. Each contributes to the, to the divorce itself, and each contributes to the subsequent fornication. There's no innocent party. Both are guilty. And therefore, neither is free to remarry. And so... Uh, this is what we're talking about concerning the waiting game. Unfortunately, there are those that, de that, that uh, ignore the proper definition and make a false charge. They charge that the game scenario inheres in the position that an innocent, truly innocent party 
one who doesn't desire the divorce, and who therefore is unjust put away, but also has the, the proper grounds of fornication on the part of the may, with God's approval, remarry. They say that's not possible. Uh, these people, uh, and in particular, the two main ringleaders, Reese Stiss, have been Brother Eddie Whitten and Jim Waldron. Documentation is there in the book. I don't have time to read all the lengthy quotations. It is simply there. You want to find it, it's there. Get the In fact, you need to have the book. The Brother Whitten, and I will read this uh, uh, particular quotation, says, now watch it. Uh, he said, Jesus said, the man in this city commits adultery, and whosoever marries her put away commits adultery. If as said, the man's remarriage frees the woman, makes her eligible to be remarried, it would be possible for the one marrying her to be guilty of adultery too. Now, the argument is also made that motive is involved. That is, if the wife pleaded with her husband not to divorce her, that is, not for fornication, that when he remarries, thus committing adultery, she is free to be remarried. First, that cannot be found in Scripture. Second, what if, and that is what is also said, what if the offended wife cannot eat for husband to commit adultery? And she commits adultery. That was so by that death and free the husband to be re remarried who had no intention of continuing the marriage. And then he goes to say this new system is also as mental divorce. He then says, any marriage arising from subsequent adultery cannot be anything other than a waiting game. And God condemns such an arrangement. Now, there's some problems with this reasoning. First, the situation can be found in Scripture that allows an innocent, even though unjustly put away, party who has the scriptural right to remarry to do so. That is, grounds of fornication. And it is, my friend, in the executive clause that modifies the two independent sentences. Great construction, according to Craig Keener. You could take the phrase, uh, uh, except for fornication, the epi uh, clause, and it can literally stand in either position, virtually in any position in that sentence. And it modifies both independent sentences. If you read the two independent sentences set from that clause, you'll see that that is the case, especially when you compare it to the parallels in Mark, chapter 10, verses 11 and 12, and in chapter 16, verse 18. The woman in the second clause is clearly the same woman that's under consideration in the first clause. And the application has to do with her having the right, the grounds of fornication. Brother Woods understood that. That's why in the second volume, I believe it was the second volume of... Uh, the uh, open forum books that he makes that particular observation. It says, Whosoever shall put his wife and marries another, literally the Greek says, keeps on, on committing adultery. And whosoever her who is away keeps on committing adultery. Now that's taking acceptive clause out of there. Clearly, if you look at those two sentences back to back, the second sentence is influenced by it's discussed in the first. It is modified by it. And uh, when you add the acceptive clause that modifies the, the first clause, you are in turn modifying necessarily the second clause. And in Greek construction, you can modify the second uh, by implication, simply by the presence of that clause. It's amazing to me that we have brethren that take the position that uh, the second clause has nothing at all to do with the first and uh, try to separate the two. That is simply grammatically impossible. We'll have more to say if time permits on that. 
In fact, I intend to put out a little more material on the writing in uh, future articles. Second, Brother Whitten wrongfully asserts that the man who has done the putting away is not on the grounds of a, uh, fornication in the case of give, be authorized to remarry. If the aggrieved man commits the adultery first, if the position Eddie opposes is true, that simply doesn't follow. In that scenario, as given by Brother Whitten, there would be no truly innocent party. The one doing the putting away would be and the wife who then commits the adultery after being put away would also be guilty. She would have to put him away first before remarriage alter the conditions of the case. Otherwise, neither would have the right of remarriage under the scenario that he gives. There is no parallel to assert, as he does, that any marriage arising from such adultery count anything other than a waiting game is not true that the assertion is true. It will also be observed that Brother Hume goes on in his readings to refer to this position as a quote-unquote new system. Well, amazing. That's simply amazing. You know where I've found this new system taught? In the Millennial Harbinger by C.L. Luce. C.L. Luce taught that. But that's a new system. I've seen it taught in the writings of J.W. McGarvey. I have found Dr. Documentation, H.A. Dixon, H. Leo Boss, uh, J. Noel Meredith, E. A. Ian, Roy Weaver, Guy N. Woods, George D. Hoff, M. C. Curfees, David Lipscomb, E. G. Sewell, so on. Now, my point is not that these men justify the position. But Brethren, one says, uh, tries to cast reflection on the position by saying, in effect, it's never been taught that way before. And you know better than that, the, the, the falsehood needs to be blown away. Brethren, I was taught this at Bellevue in Pensacola, Florida by Brother Klein and Brother Deaver. I have no idea they get the idea today that this is something new and uh, simply did not exist before. Then there's this charge that, uh, well, this is mental divorce. It's a divorce or a putting away that takes place in the mind of the individual. Well, let me ask you this. Is there any mental aspect in the course of any divorce that takes place, brethren? Think about it. Is there any mental aspect involved at all? in the process of the divorce. If the first putting away, up for fornication, did not sever the marriage bond, this is really where we get to the issue, and Brother Whitten and Brother Waldron both admit that it does not. They're with us. That end of, the thing is, while they admit that that is the case and observe the principle that we're arguing for, they try it around and deny the application of it. And that's where they fail. But if the first putting away did not sever the marriage bond, as the first putting away is no real putting away, and E.A. Elam even makes that statement, in the sight of God, then in reality, as far as the Word of God is concerned, the only, there's only one putting away that really takes place, and that's when the innocent party puts away the guilty, as far as God's concerned. But in thinking about this mental aspect question, is there any mental aspect involved in the filing of the suit? It's, are these brethren contend, is what they must contend, if they're going to do away with any mental aspect involved in the divorce, if they're going to just throw that out as though that's some big bugbear that uh, just is to scare people off, are they willing to sign a proposition where they affirm 
that uh, the cause has to be put in writing. It's not in the mind of the individual who is filing for the divorce. Think about it. Must it be in the civil suit itself? Must it also be gaveled specifically by the judge as being on the grounds of fornication for it to be a valid divorce in the sight of God? Somebody says, well, oh yeah, it's got to be that way. All right, about 36 states in the Union you've drilled out will not permit you to get a civil divorce period on, that, on those grounds. It's called no-fault divorce or some other such. And so if you say it has to be in the records as, as uh, gaveled by the judge on the grounds of fornication, guess what? 36 states will not permit you to do that. And of the other 14, many of those they may permit divorce on the grounds of fornication, require such a high standard or establish such a high bar of, of evidence that it's virtually impossible without a written confession. So what are you going to do in those cases? Or what do you do when you have a judge who just arbitrarily on judicial activism decides that fornication or adultery should not be a grounds despite the law says? Does the innocent party lose his or her right by an arbitrary decision of a judge in contrary to civil law? What's the implications of that position? Is, must there be a writing with civil document itself serves as the instrument of implementation of the judicial decision? Must that also be there? And if not, why not? We go away from all mental aspects of this thing. We want to put it solely, totally in the civil court. And that's really the position of these brethren are. What about in the record of the case and file in City Hall? What if there's a misstatement there? What if the cause is not properly recorded as being for fornication? Does that invalidate? judicial decision, and thus the divorce. Brethren, this is where these folks have put themselves when they start ridiculing what they call mental divorce and so on and trying to impose ideas upon the, upon the text. The text does not bear. They cannot address these matters. And so the situation with civil uh, divorce. And, you know, part of the problem, this is the pro problem. We have brethren who try to impose upon you 19 and a Perry Mason-like judicial situation that just amazingly parallels 20th and 21st century America. That's what they're trying to do. And most Nations do not and have not operate way, brethren, as far as their divorce systems are concerned. You take, for instance, in Egypt. In ancient Egypt, there is, I was reading the other day, there is no word for in the hieroglyphics. No word. Do you mean that Christians living in Egypt could not divorce? They had no scriptural right uh, all of that was taken away. While they had no formal divorce procedure, they had a process by which they viewed a relationship as coming to an end. They just didn't call it divorce. And it was a very simple procedure where the man went into the house, grabbed the woman, threw her out the door. <laughs> and that was the end of it. And if he wanted to another wife, he just went down the street and convinced her to move in with him, or if he was of a social, he could even compel her to do, do so and contract another marriage that, that way. There are some cultures in America, in uh, Samoa, for instance, 
uh, divorce, their use of the word divorce is used to describe situations where the woman just moves out of the house. She is said to have divorced her husband. Separation. Or he throws her out of the house, or maybe if she's bigger than he is, she throws him out. In other cultures, the Muslims, you say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. And of course, now the man is the one who has the right to do that. In cultures where they do that in Islam, there has to be a look. You give them a look. And then you say, I divorce I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. I was telling some ladies the other day about that, and one of the sisters spoke up and says, if my husband ever gave me that look, he'd never get that first, I divorce you, out. <laughs> That'd be the end of it. But that is their putting away, that they put away. Just recently, India, three interesting situations took place, brethren. In one case, a man who was having uh, some medical problems decided to take some medication. I believe he had a headache or something like that. Maybe he took some Tylenol or something equivalent. Went to bed, and in his sleep, he said out loud, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you in Urdu. His wife heard what he said, and she just happened to mention it to some of her friends the next day. You know the, the old story about the different means of mass communication. One of them was one. And they, if I'd said telegraph, they wouldn't have known. This, a lot of these younger folks wouldn't relate to that. But they spread around. They went around and were telling everybody and got back to the city of the elder. And they came and told the couple, you're divorced. But they didn't intend on divorcing tough luck, you're divorced. You have now, you're now, by virtue of the, of our religious beliefs and practices, you are now divorced, and you have to straight, and, and you cannot be his wife again until you first become the wife of another man, and stay with him, right? and then, if he decides to divorce you, then you can go back to your first husband. That's what they decree. Now, brethren, that's civil law. We're going to put it in the hands of civil law, T, totally. Now see what you come up with. Other case in India, woman was raped by her uh, father-in-law. Again, the religious leaders got together at her school that they are all adhere to for the religious advice, and they were told that you're now the rape divorced her. And not only that, she is now married to the one that raped her. We've got one fellow running around the countryside down here at Church, Texas, teaching that sex is married. Brethren, it's in his own writing, and signed by his own hand. You've got the documentation on it. That sexual intercourse constitutes marriage. Of course, that's Brother Stan Crowley. Well, these folks said it. The rape married them. And no longer married to your original husband. You're married to your old lecherous, lascivious father-in-law. Another woman married a snake. Married a snake. Now, brethren, we're told a marriage is a marriage is a marriage. A divorce is a divorce is a divorce. If that's the case, then she's married to the snake. There are some that are married to two-legged ones. She's just got one that slithers on the ground. <laughs> but given the position that is affirmed by some of our brethren, including the position that is being taken by Brother Whitten, Brother uh, Waldron and others, given the decision and the practice of the laws of the land of India in that particular part of the nation, if she files for divorce against the snake and decides she wants to marry the two-legged kind, then uh, she can't do so. She's lost her right to remarry. She's forfeited. 
And, uh, and that's the implication of this nonsense. So let them wrestle with those type situations, deal with those matters, and then ask themselves. Rep. Jim Waldron likes to make a remark. He says, you know, there is no more uh, grounds or no more evidence for a mental divorce and by the way, we're not contending for a mental divorce in the sense of a purely mental divorce, and that's an absurd statement to begin with. At any event, there is mental aspect involved here. The cause has to be in the mind of the individual who does the putting away, and especially in the mind of God, because he's the one that does the seven. But Brother Waldron said there's no more evidence for mental divorce than there is for mental baptism. I know what he means by that. The question, is there any mental aspect of baptism? Must one stand some things or have in their mind certain in order for that baptism to be valid in the sight of God? Most certainly. And so his remarkably just uh, so much rhetoric. Reminds me of the description one time when Brother Joe Gilmore said he used in debate with a fellow. He was debating a, an individual who, who uh, was very boisterous. And Brother Gilmore said there were a lot of Indians in the audience and he said, lots of thunder, big cloud, no rain. <laughs> and that's it is with these folks. Well, what about the civil law trumps God's law doctrine? Actually, the uh, situation we're facing here and you brethren are dealing with in South Texas and other parts of the brotherhood, on this, uh, a marriage is a marriage is a marriage, and a divorce is a divorce is a divorce. This view has been espoused in sundry forms over the past few years. There are variations of it, and uh, I have a documentation of various positions, brethren, take on it. I call it the weak bond view. Uh, Berlin Park described it as the explicit only view, and uh, some brethren call it the to the courthouse view. Then them are very descriptive of the consequences and implications of the doctrine. Brian Yeager is one who contends, for instance, that the marriage bond can be severed on trivial grounds. He states sympathetically that when such a divorce takes place, that is, a divorce not for fornication, occurs, the marriage is over. Adding, the man and the woman are now unmarried, just as one who has never been married before or widowed. Brother Stan Crowley, he goes probably to the extreme view of all in affirming that distancing itself is always divorce. That's his position, any sort of distancing. Now, brethren, if that's the case, you think about this. And Brother Crowley claims to believe that the innocent party has the right to divorce on the grounds of fornication, at least somewhere along the line, because he said that numerous times in his speech at Beeville. And it's in his writings that he gave to the brethren at Beeville. But if you take that position and follow the logic of it, there is no divorce ever possible. When the man, the man could stand there, Go to his wife and say, Honey, I'm going to go commit adultery tonight. I'm telling you that right now. Goodbye. Walk right the door. Go down, commit the adultery, even take pictures of it. Come back, present her with the evidence. But she is unable to put him away. You say, Well, why? Because the very moment he walks out that door, he's distanced himself from her, and he has now corrizoed the marriage, and that's his word for it. That's what he said down at Beville. It's on record. He will have corrizoed the marriage, and I've allowed his wife put her away. He has no right. 
In fact, he could do it in the back bedroom. And because he separates himself from her, and they're not in agreement on the matter, and he takes his uh, boy right on the back room. And I, brethren, I'm not wanting to be uh, filthy about this. This is his position. This is the implication of it. This is what where it leads. He go into the back room, commit the adultery, and by the very act have distanced himself from her, put her away at the same time, so that now she cannot remarry anybody. She can't even put him away. Brethren, that's ungodly. That is an ungodly doctrine. And, well, it's stupid. <laughs> and on top of that, and he even makes a, he says that once they're up a luo, they're up a luo. You can't do it again. To once say, always say. And once opaluoed, always opaluoed makes about as much sense. In fact, once saved, always saved makes a little more sense than that does. As I said, he contends the sex act is marriage. And by the way, brethren, did you see the snow job that went on at church? They had snow in San Antonio. Uh, in in the fall of last year, you, know, you have called it. They were passing around a document that, in effect, was telling people that everything's been is all right. We've been just misunderstood, and a bunch of radicals stirring up. But you know, all the documents they passed out, they also had a document that puts the lie to that document. The document that they were passing out along with it set out expressly was authorized by the elders to be preached from the pulpit of a church. Now, now, why would you have to tell your preacher to issue a public statement and uh, authorized by the elders telling him exactly, and not only telling him, but telling the congregation what was authorized as only authorized if there was not a problem with it to start with? Let them harmonize those two documents together. Crowley has affirmed that marriage does not really exist until it is consummated by the sex act. Poor old Joseph and Mary were never really married until some time after Jesus was born, even though they had to be prior to birth. This error implies that when the priest stands, before the crowd that stands before the audience and says, I pronounce you husband and wife, he lies. It also says that Whipple goes in and signs the register as Mr. and Mrs. Jones, they lie. It also implies that anything leading up to, now watch it, sexual intercourse itself. And brethren, we could get quite graphic to illustrate the point. I don't want to do that. But anything, any touching, any activity short of the intercourse itself, which would be would be fornication, because they're not married. Again, brethren, that's ungodly. And that somehow in the process of the intercourse, suddenly they're man and wife. God joins them through a sex act that is fornication at the start. But if you can, it's ridiculous. The fact of the matter is a civil divorce does not sever a marriage bond. I have several arguments laid out there. Get Malachi chapter 2, verse 14. You just read it in the King James text. I've looked at it in over 150 different translations. And you know what? All of them get it right. Even the NIV got it right. Now look at it. Yet ye say, Wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. How had they dealt treacherously? And put away 
completed act. They had put away their wives, their Hebrew wives, in order to marry Samaritan women. They had dealt treacherously with a wife of you. You've dealt treacherously against her. Yet, is she the opinion and the wife of thy covenant? You'll notice in the King James, his is in italics. That's because it does not expressly stand in the Hebrew text. But the grammar demands it. Not only in Hebrew, brethren, but in the Septuagint Greek text, which was based on the Hebrew. And the evidence is there in the book. Every translation has followed that. Even though, some translations read, even though she is your wife and the, thy covenant, uh, or the, the, thy wife of thy covenant. She's your companion, wife of thy covenant. You put her away. She is still in this, this relationship. You dealt treacherously with her completed action. But, our time's gone. But she is still your wife. Brethren, they cannot touch that with a ten-foot pole. And they haven't attempted to do it. The fact of the matter is, a civil divorce does not sever a Matthew 19, 6 marriage. It simply cannot do it. What God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. It does not. In fact, you, could, you know what his oath is? It's adultery. Now, what is adultery? By admission, it is the sex, it is sex, illicit sex, be, between two people, one of whom, at least, is married to someone else. Now, that's consistent with the definition of the Greek lexicons and the Hebrew lexicons and dictionaries. And, you know, get, and guess what? Stan Crowley doesn't like that. Brethren, marriage is a sacred institution in God's sight. It is an important institution. Civil law cannot just arbitrarily make a marriage, and civil law cannot arbitrarily break a marriage. Only God joins and only God severs. And the only grounds on the basis of the severance beyond death itself is fornication by one of the spouses. That is the only grounds accepted in chapter 19, verse 9. And we stand ready to deal and debate this with any of these brethren that oppose that teaching. They did. We did not start this battle. They did. And I've got the documentation and have presented the documentation in other places, contending for the in particular. What have they said about it? Silent as a tomb. Brethren, here are folks who are very bold when they're by themselves and way out yonder making their rocks and making their attacks but when they're confronted with it, they're not ready to put up. What has truth to fear? Absolutely nothing. They are not right. They are as wrong as wrong can be. They have caused division, and now they expect us just to roll and take it. But brethren, I got news for you. I don't like rolling over. Perhaps this evening, you're not a member of the body of Christ. You haven't obeyed the gospel. You desire to become a child of God. You believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And you're willing now to repent of your sins, to of those sins, and confess Christ, just as the Ethiopian eunuch did, and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Those sins washed away with this precious blood. Or maybe you're a child of God who is in sin and you desire the prayers of the congregation on your behalf. You're willing to make confession of it. It's a public sin. We'll pray with you. You'll be given. You have God's word and assurance on it. Exhort you to come while together we stand in sin.